again, just thank you to, uh, to the, everyone for inviting me to speak. So I guess I just wanted to kind of highlight that the purpose of today's talk was meant to be um, kind of an overview of my PhD work and um, just to kind of summarize um, some of the different elements that came out of it. So I'll get into this in a little bit more detail in a while, but the side that we decided to focus on was the tracking of hydrothermal fluids in sediment hosted zinc cloud ore deposits, specifically looking at pyrite chemistry. Um, and I'll kind of explain where this fits into my overall project in a couple of minutes, but just to, to flag, um, part of this presentation was used in an ore deposits hub collaboration with an Irish Economic Association uh, for Economic Geology uh, event that took place last year. So apologies if you've seen some of the, the information and data before, but um, and we're hoping that it will be 30 minutes. So let's, let's find out. And moving on. Okay, so just, just quickly um, to kind of go over what I'm going to be talking about today. So the kind of overall purpose was the PhD summary. Um, but today's talk is going to focus in a little bit on Irish lead zinc, give a bit of a context and go over a range of different data sets, including pyrogenetic studies, and then relate those to mineral composition and sulfur isotopes. And while I will show some other sulfides and nice pictures of sulfides from the uh, study area, the pyrite is going to be the main focus. Um, and also try to bring it into potential factors toward mineralization. So at the end of the talk, I'm hoping that I'll have converted some of you to pyrite as a, a useful tool in economic geology and that you'll be able to understand um, a little bit more about the ore forming processes in the Irish lead zinc ore field and how it could potentially be related to other sediment hosted and similar deposits globally. So jumping into the overall project so i just want to spend a couple of minutes since i was uh, asked to talk about my phd to talk about my actual phd and before i go into the introduction to ireland lead zinc um, and just for context here is a photo of me submitting well not me but my thesis being submitted with an inflatable santa uh ucd last year so i finished last year it was based at ucd and icrag with supervisors julia Minouge, uh, who's in the audience and steve hollis um, and there was lots of people who helped in um, different aspects of the project, but I just really wanted to say thank you to everyone who helped out as well during the entire project. It was a journey. Um, and overall, the project was looking at geochemical studies of Southern Irish ore field, focusing on the Sheen mine, which you may have come across before, but it's a mine in the south of Ireland that was this, uh, Ireland's second largest known base metal deposit. So overall, the project had a combined application of isotopes and mineral chemistry studies to track fluid flow and hydrothermal evolution. And there was lots of different stages to the project. Um, and so to kind of give a little bit of an indication of that, we can look at this breakdown, I guess, of the way we looked at samples and the overall workflow. And there's kind of a two prong approach to the overall PhD. So we were looking at early carbonates and carbonates that are found at different stages of mineralization. Um, and also sulfides associated with mineralization. Um, and so while I'm not going to be spending time on the carbonates today, they are really important in terms of the overall story being told. So if anyone has any questions about that, uh, I do actually have a presentation available from the SGA conference. If any of you have attended that or just get in touch, um, which I'll, I'll highlight at the end of the talk again. So in terms of the kind of overall workflow and methodology, the project was quite flexible with initial studies of poorly characterized areas of Lachine. And so just for context, Lachine is probably one of the best uh, studied deposits in Ireland. It's been operational for over 15 years. There's a huge host of uh, drill cores still available. So you get really nice spatial distribution of samples. Um, and there's been a lot of really in-depth studies in terms of geology, isotopes already done on Lachine. But there are some areas that weren't really looked at for different reasons, um, one being that they could have been found toward the end of the mine life, uh, closed in 2015. And so this is kind of what we wanted to start with, was understanding these um, areas. So overall, the aim was to build on previous work and to study the isotope and chemical evolution of hydrothermal fluids from the early pre ore stages to post ore stages, and to try identify potential geochemical vectors toward mineralization. So I'm not really going to be talking in too much detail about the overall workflow, but if there's any people who are kind of working on similar projects don't want to ask questions about that, please fire away at them. Um, but just to give you a context of the type of data chapters and overview of what was actually looked at, 
And uh, these are the data chapters with the title. So um, ideally they'll be corresponding to papers. And um, so this first one, for example, has been published with economic geology and um, looking at a really high grade ore body toward the north of Lachine deposit, Old Island pod. Then we also look at uh, mineralization in the list of Ulite member hosted formation, which I'll be discussing a little bit today and show you some examples of. Um, but the main one for today is the pyrite trace element composition. So this was looking at pyrite in more detail from across the Lachine deposit to see if what we could figure out from the pyrite and to look at the, the hydrothermal fluid flow, especially in the early stages of mineralization. And then completely, uh, well, apparently, like looks unrelated is uh, this chapter that was spent looking at carbonized samples using techniques like clumped oxygen carbon, strontium, and hydrogen isotope analysis. In particular, looking at dolomitized limestones, or, uh, host rock, and other hydrothermal carbonate phases that are found throughout deposits. So, today, um, hopefully, that's kind of given you a bit of context to what my overall project is based on. And I just really wanted to zoom in on pyrite today. And <laughs> Many of you are probably wondering why, but pyrite is a major part of many global hydrothermal ore deposits, um, some listed here, but even within Ireland, it is often the only sulfide found in drill core. Uh, um, and so this can mean that someone has drilled a borehole, there's, it's absolutely barren apart from some pyrite, um, and then five meters away there could be beautiful massive zinc lead mineralization. And so how can we use this to find that mineralization? How can we use the pyrite to tell where we are in relation to the mineralization? So that brings us to why pyrite. And so pyrite mineral chemistry overall has been used in many other deposits, in particular SEDEX um, and VMS, including isotopes, values, and textures to study the formation conditions and fluid characteristics and overall evolution. And with many people working toward developing pyrite as a vector toward mineralization. And a term I learned many years ago, which I think is quite accurate and funny for pyrite is the garbage can mineral. And this kind of just relates to the fact that pyrite absorbs a, a lot of the trace element compositions of lighter hydrothermal fluid. So it's a recorder of the influence of lighter hydrothermal fluid. And so it can be used to monitor changes of um, um, fluid composition and hydrothermal systems. Um, and really, I find that there's two types of people when it comes to pyrite often. You either absolutely love it and think it's great and think it can solve all of the world's problems, or you think it's absolutely useful, useless, which I used to be that person until I did a bit more study on it. So hopefully I will convert some people to the way of pyrite. Um, and just to highlight, there's lots of studies and different techniques that you can use in relation to mineral chemistry for pyrite. And so people have been using concentrations and ratios of some elements like cobalt nickel as ore discriminators to look at source fluids. Um, and there's also a strong potential for geochemical vectors to be developed in exploration. So to the study area. Um, so we're going to be looking at the Southern Irish zinc lead ore field and just wanted to start you off with some key concepts. This is just to keep in mind as we're walking through um, the rest of the talk. Um, but in Ireland, much of the mineralization is hosted by lower carboniferous marine rocks, which is shown mostly by these blue colors in the image here. Um, and in the Southern Irish ore field in particular, zinc lead deposits are generally found along an area locally referred to as the Rathowney Trend, um, which is a roughly 40 kilometer northeast trending zone um, that's uh, composed mostly of wall source and limestone formation that has been dolomitized, and this includes the Lachine and Galmoy deposits. So uh, just to remember, this is where Lachine, the deposit we're talking about today is. And so mineralization in deposits in Southern Irish ore field, including Lachine, are typically structurally controlled, with faults acting as conduits for fluid movements, and also facilitating fluid mixing. So we have a dual fluid mixing or a dual fluid source in Ireland um, and this is a, a key uh, the mixing between these two sources is a key process linked to mineralization and so there's in terms of the the sources there, we have a really hot hydrothermal um, fluid that has back not bacteriogenic sorry um, it hosts hydrothermal sulfur which is thought to be sourced from the basement rocks but we also have this much cooler uh, brine fluid that is full of bacteriogenically 
reduced uh, sulfur, which has really low sulfur isotope signatures, which you'll see in a little bit as well. There's a lot of work that's been put into developing this dual fluid source model, um, which I won't be going into a lot of detail about how this came about today, but just for context. Okay, so, and just to highlight the fluids involved in mineralization, Lachine and uh, the Southern Irish ore field are part of a multi-stage evolving hydrotrome continuum. That might include the pyrite phase that we're going to be talking about today, but it also extended on either side of that as well. So it's just important to remember that the what we're look, about to look at in terms of the pyrite is a snapshot of the entire hydrotrome system. And it's uh, very overall quite complex. Um, but moving into Lachine itself. So this is just a kind of standard view of Lachine deposit with ore bodies outlined with gray. And so Lachine was operational for over 15 years, uh, produced quite a lot of zinc and lead, and it only closed in 2015. But overall, it's composed of strata bound zinc lead ore bodies, which are strongly controlled by uh, an extensional left sampling ramp relay fault array. And so, in which also facilitated fluid movement in Lachine. Um, but within Lachine, mineralization is generally hosted by the wall source and limestone formation, which we're going to refer to as WLF for <laughs> quite a lot of the presentations. So, you know, that abbreviation means. But within Lachine, there's also some smaller but quite significant occurrences of mineralization in the Listoff Ulite member or LOM for short. Um, so, Generally, the list of you light member is stratigraphically lower than the wall source in limestone, but mineralization is often seen where it's juxtaposed adjacent to the WLF. And so just to kind of highlight the these are different ore zones um, outlined in case you haven't seen this schematic before, and quite a lot of the previous work has focused on main zone here and Derryville, Derryville with quite little work on the other ore zones, especially the island pod ore body, which was found quite late into the mining life. So a couple of areas I wanted to point out on this map um, that I'll be discussing later and just um, so you know where they are in relation to everything else. So as I mentioned, some of the initial studies were uh, spent characterizing some of the less well understand, understood areas of the scene. And so in particular, this included the island pod ore body and also what's referred to as the steel ore region, which is uh, hosted by the stuff you learn. So the island pod, this one's particularly important because it's a, quite a distal, very high grade and um, ore body, which experienced less replacement than elsewhere in the sheen. But because of this better preservation, I guess, it offers a pretty unique opportunity to study things like the replacement processes that affected the sheen and to begin to unravel the full history of what happened at the, the, the sheen mine. As you can see, it is quite complex and there's been a lot of studies done on unraveling the structural history and things like that. And before I forget to, I just wanted to highlight what I mean by the word halo when I use it. So it's uh, kind of be mentioned um, in different places. So ore body versus halo just means it's kind of in relation to where the samples are from. So within the ore body um, are just from the ore body outlines here and, and any samples from the halo refer to samples outside of this boundary. And this boundary was defined by the mining company at the time of operation. So it's, um, it's uh, just for reference. So then if we look at the steel ores, um, this is a proximal location. So it's right next to some feeder fault areas. Um, and importantly with the steel ore, it actually forms where two normal faults intersect and we get a really I guess complex assemblage of sulfides and much more, I say, for example, nickel bearing sulfides and sulfo salts, um, and much more replacement um, than elsewhere. But it's generally characterized by quite a lot of uh, galena and, and sphalerite, mostly galena. So, just uh, to point out, samples used in this study, while they do focus on the island pod, and there's quite a few representative ones from the steel ore. There are samples from the main zone, Derryville, um, from both wall source and limestone and list of light hosted mineralization, but also the relay ramp system that falls in between them. So kind of already mentioned this, that the overall aim of this machine based study was to look at the hydrothermal fluid variation, both temporally and spatially. 
at Lachine to understand the full evolution of the system and to understand the patterns um, that we're seeing. So this is <laughs> quite a lot of information here, but this is just for reference. Um, so if you do want to look at this in a bit more detail, it's um, the first one is included with the abbreviation explanations in the paper. Um, but this is just kind of to show you the overall trend where we have our early diagenetic and iron dominated system moving into main ore stage and then late main ore stage. Um, and so depending on what stage you're working in, you have different textures associated, different mineral assemblages. But in general, the mineralogy of Lachine is relatively simple and we get quite a lot of pyrite, sphalerite and glina. However, there are multiple phases of each with infilling and a particular replacive, uh, repla reflective of a dynamic and evolving system and really emphasis on the replacive nature of sulfides as there is quite a lot of close associations of replacement fe features that I'll be um, going over today. And just to highlight as well, uh, these aren't going to be discussed in detail today, but there are a lot of other, like, uh, for example, arsenic and cobalt sulfides, and sulfur salts, um, especially in the more proximal zone, so right next to those feeder faults. Um, and it, these often are, uh, are linked with more complex textural features as well. And so just as I mentioned, we generally get this progression from iron dominated to zinc lead dominated, um, and this corresponds to an increase in hydrothermal activity. But it's also really important to point out here that this is a transitional uh, system. So it's not that we just get purely pyrite in the early stages and then no pyrite after that or anything like that. There is um, small intergrowths, for example, of later sulfides in these early phases and vice versa. And so I just wanted to kind of drill home the message here that replacement is a really key process that uh, especially in Lachine that affects the isotope and mineral chemistry distribution of Lachine. So it's really important to have that really uh, detailed paragenetic understanding to understand what your data is actually telling. And uh, this is just an example of some of the sulfides shown in that paragenetic table. And uh, really, I don't have time to go into them, but it seemed a shame not to show some things other than just pure pyrite. Um, and just to highlight, there's a lot of really complex textures related to pirate. I'm going to go into in detail, but the relationship of replacement, it gets very complex where you have Galena replacing earlier sphalerite that's replaced earlier pyrite. And that's probably one of the most simple versions of it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on um, outside of pyrite too. So going into pyrite, as part of this study, we undertook kind of a, a simplified classification of pyrites. Um, so generally in past studies, when work on Lachine had been done, pyrite was grouped into to one. And so there wasn't any uh, subdivisions to look at how the mineral chemistry varies or anything like uh, uh, to the extent of more recent studies. Um, some recent PhDs uh, like Oakley Turner have done initial uh, paragenetic studies of pyrite and things like that Lachine. So there's a lot of ongoing work related to this. Um, but just to kind of uh, get into the classification scheme used today. We have our multiple phases of pyrite. One in particular is diagenetic pyrite, and this is the one that has really low sulfur isotope signatures. So generally less than minus 30 per mil, and generally uh, forms without the influence of hydrothermal fluids. And we don't see anything like morphological uh, zoning or anything like that, that you'd expect. Then, as we kind of move into the more hydrothermally active stages, we get this early iron dominated event. We get multiple phases of hydrothermal pyrites with increasing textural and geochemical complexity. But really importantly, this iron dominated event occurs just before the main zinc lead mineralization. So when we're seeing the bulk of sphalerite and glina. And so the pyrites here record the, the ramping up of the system. Um, as the hydrothermal influx is continued. And so we have a really great record of snapshots in the depositional conditions that led to main stage zinc lead mineralization. And so just to have a really simplified version of um, uh, this kind of pyrite classification scheme, we have pyrite zero, which is the diagenetic pyrite and generally looks like something like this, can vary quite a bit, but it's often inclusion rich. 
Um, then we have our pyrite one, which is actually only found in the list of oolite lom, um, and so it often preserves oolitic textures and things like this. So here's an example. So pyrite two, uh, so this is actually the first pyrite phase that's found in both the wall source and, and the list of oolite, and there's really nice hydrothermal influence. Uh, we often get these concentrically zoned pyrites or it, uh, solitary grains, or it can form as overlap or overgrowths on earlier pyrites as well. And um, then we have our pyrite tree, which pyrite tree gets pretty complex in terms of its growth zoning. And this is especially observable under SEM and just can vary and become much more chaotic as you get closer to say feeder faults um, in particular Dairyville and main zone. And there's also pyrite four, which isn't discussed um, today at all, but it's generally quite late in filling and minor in terms of the, the samples I was looking at as well. So that's why it wasn't included. And so just to point out, these are the terminology I'll be using as I go into the, the pyrochemistry data. And there are some subdivisions of these as well, but they're just not gonna be discussed in detail of today's talk, but I'm happy to answer some questions if you have anything that you'd like to know about that. Um, Cause I will be showing some examples in a couple of slides. Okay, so pyrite mineral chemistry. Um, Okay, so I just realized it's almost half past, so I'm gonna zoom. But um, just for context, uh, these images are going to be used uh, throughout the, the next few slides, which are focusing on the mineral chemistry. Um, and really this is just to remind you of the different pyrite phases we're looking at because it's, it's a quite a lot of information being thrown at you. So just to kind of highlight the pyrite phases often have quite complex relationships with each other, overgrowing, sometimes replacing, and so it can lead to quite complex textural relationships. But really importantly, there are geochemical, in, uh, in terms of trace element concentration differences between these pyrite phases. So it's quite important that we unravel it, especially when it comes to things like um, metallurgical studies and also just trying to understand the, the formation processes in the deposit. And so, kind of makes sense. Uh, hydrothermal influence increases a paradigmatic stage, leading to relative increases of trace elements associated with hydrothermal fluids. And so often see um, quite a big increase in arsenic, cobalt, nickel, copper, um, well, not, not the biggest of copper, but there is some. And this is just a summary of the trace element distributions we see with each of the pyrite phases. So pyrite one and zero, the ones that kind of form with limited to no hydrothermal influence. Um, so pyrite zero, wall source and limestone hosted, generally low of all trace elements, except for nickel relative to later phases. Um, so there's a question about what's the source of nickel there as well. And then we come to pyrite one, um, which does have a little bit more of a hydrothermal influence, but uh, generally low trace element associations, except for arsenic relative to other phases. And in pyrite two and three, we start to see increases in trace element concentrations of arsenic, nickel, and copper, and things like this. But really interestingly, is the relationship of thallium in these layer deposits, and especially as we go into pyrite three. So just before we go into looking at the larger scale pyrite variation by stage, um, just wanted to just to, to talk about grain scale variation for a couple of minutes. So here. This is in relation to uh, pyrite two, actually, I should point out. Um, as I mentioned, we tend to get two main forms of pyrite two. So we have our individual concentrically zoned pyrite grains, which very similar morphological um, kind of features in the more distal and proximal sense with island pod versus steel ore, for example, we see virtually the exact same uh, textures. But we often see an increase in trace element concentrations within these grains. So, for example, cobalt and arsenic, um, and these samples are from the island pod ore body. So these are all quite distal and um, uh, away from any known feeder areas. And we see this relative increase in core to rim. And so we also see overgrowths of pyrite 2 and pyrite 3 on earlier phases. And this is where that subdivision comes into play, because there is um, a subdivision referred to as uh, pyrite 2a and pyrite 3b. Uh, that's not discussed in detail today, but uh, it's in this bottom image, for example, this really pale Andresium <laughs> band, which is I think about 10 microns thick, there's a few examples, have the highest concentrations of arsenic, cobalt, and nickel 
and thallium from the entire deposit. And this is from like uh, over 800 samples. It's a really high concentration, this first initial pulse um, of, of fluid. But then we kind of go into the more characteristic pyrite too, which has elevated levels, but lower um, uh, relative to that influx there. And just to, to kind of point out here um, why this is important to look at the grain scale, like so we're seeing chemical zoning, which we also see textural zoning um, quite closely. And this, this is very suggestive of episodic flow. And so this shows that we have a really continuously evolving system with multiple pulses of hydrothermal fluids coming in, each with slightly variable trace element concentrations in some way. And so we get really intense concentrations in some pulses and lower in others. Um, and this is quite useful in terms of just looking at the early stages of the formation of this deposit, which are often overprinted in some other deposits. And just really the takeaway message here is pyrite, often <laughs> in visual crane, can record the entire early hydrothermal evolution of a mineralizing system and can provide such invaluable data when you're trying to understand what's actually just going on. Um, and so just wanted to flag here again. Um, there's also another feature when you look at the grain scale that uh, it's not always as obvious, but because we have these later hydrothermal events where we get multiple pyrite phases and then others like um, sulfides replacing these, we often get increased levels of certain elements associated with these early phases of diagenetic um, pyrite that are more typically linked with later hydrothermal fluids. But when you actually go and look at those grains under a microscope and try to figure out why this is happening, if it's a um, thing, it actually uh, seems like it's more related to replacement and overprinting features. And while these elements like, um, like copper and things might be elevated in some samples, it's not actually substituted into the crystal lattice. It's more um, nano inclusions related to later hydrothermal fluids. But the main thing here <laughs> um, that I'm trying to say is this shows that these early pyrites that are common in most samples across Ireland and probably in very similar deposits elsewhere, do record the influence of later hydrothermal fluids. So if we have a sample of diagenetic pyrite that no apparent indication of mineralization being five meters away, how can we look at the mineral chemistry of that pyrite and use it to um, find that mineralization? So it does record the influence of later hydrothermal fluids. So there's a potential vector to be developed there. And quickly, this is the last section, I believe. <laughs> Sorry, hallelujah. Um, so just looking at the pyrite generations, and here's our example images, looking by host. So here we have our wall source and limestone formation. Um, and these are the slides you may have seen before, so I don't feel too bad going over quickly. Um, but, oh, my pyrite's in the way. So we see a relative increase of arsenic and thallium um, as we go from our early diagenetic to our more complex hydrothermal zone pyrites of pyrite tree. Um, and arsenic and thallium show really interesting relationships across the gene, and in particular, ratios of these have a lot of potential to be looked at. And if I can skip. But then we see the opposite for things like copper and nickel. And so perhaps um, in these samples, this is suggesting that the initial fluids um, had relatively increased copper and nickel and then depleted. But also, there's a potential for other sources of nickel as well in, um, say, the island pod uh, ore body, which even though it's quite far away, it has the highest concentrations of nickel. Um, and then moving on, if we just look at the stuff Ulite hosted pyrite. And so just for context, this is generally where the stuff Ulite is juxtaposed against the Walsh limestone. But again, we're seeing relative increase um, of copper and nickel with time. Oh, and back. Um, but it's a bit more variable in terms of other trace elements, but we do see a relative increase in arsenic, for example, in pyrite two and three here, um, while pyrite one is slightly more elevated than the corresponding pyrite zero and all sorts of limestone. And then just in line with that, if we look at pyrite one and pyrite zero, so they are hosted in different um, materials and the stuff you like pyrite one does have uh, some influence of hydrothermal fluids, but um, Oh, there we go. And um, they are comparable in a lot of ways as well. I'm just uh, going to flag the data up for you. And so just to mention here that the variation by ore zones, I'm not going to be obviously going into it in detail today. Uh, it's not enough time. 
Um, but there are a couple of really interesting things, such as the the island pod versus the steel region, um, because it's the kind of proximal versus distal samples. And even though a lot of people would associate nickel with hydrothermal nickel, it actually is quite elevated in the island pod ore body, which has a less influ or less significant influence uh, than elsewhere at Lachine as well. So there's a question about why is that. Um, but if you're interested in looking at the ore zone variation, um, happy to ask any questions, but there's also a great paper by Kuhn Tormans that looks at the metal distributions at Lachine based on um, huge data sets that are available. And there's also other papers by other past workers that unravel the structural history of Lachine as well, well worth a read. And just lastly on the pyrite mineral front, uh, is probably one of the most significant that is why Italium and arsenic are very key elements, I think. Um, so this is going back to the island pod, where if we just step back and think about our Lachine location map, this is the distal ore body that's quite far away from any known feeder zones, and so hydrothermal input, and while there is clear hydrothermal influence, um, one thing that we're seeing between the ore body and the halo is a relative decrease in both thallium and arsenic as you step away. And so while the samples in the halo were relatively close to the ore body, um, so we will need more sampling to confirm if this uh, actually is a trend that we're seeing. It does show a lot of promise for thallium and arsenic in looking for mineralization because we're seeing this relative increase of these elements as you move toward ore. And this is really just to throw in there for any questions because um, um, I have basically more uh, thought and discussion is required on how sulfur isotope signatures relate to mineral chemistry. Um, and this is just kind of for context. If anyone has any questions, absolutely fire away. Um, oh, why did that skip so much? And really, I just wanted to flag that even in sulfur isotopes, the influence of replacement is really important. Um, and if you want to read more about that, please check out my paper, uh, which does discuss recycling of sulfur and how we can see that um, in the resulting data as well. OK, so. Lastly, I just wanted to say, um, so we have the list of Ulite member. Um, it's comparable to the Walls Ocean Limestone. Um, it's great, but it's really interesting that there's no spatial difference in sulfur isotope values um, as observed with mineral chemistry data. So what I've just shown you in terms of the thallium and arsenic variation decreasing as you move away from ore, you do not see that with the sulfur isotope values. So unfortunately, sulfur isotopes do not look like a promising vector, um, but it's also quite interesting as why that is. Um, so a lot more work needs to be done on comparing this um, these data sets. But again, the sulfur isotope data does suggest that early pyrites provide a record of this ramping up of the system. So it, it's really nice um, to get that from both data sets. I just wanted to put this out here as well, because I think it's quite interesting. Um, but so we've seen that like sulfur recycling does occur. And so um, this is, uh, happens in quite a lot of deposits around the world. Um, and one paper in particular by a um, colleague, Phil um, Griegler, is uh, from the George Fisher. Um, it's a really nice paper. Um, but so we know sulfur is being recycled. Um, and this is particularly interesting because uh, pyrite is often replaced by sphalerite with direct replacement. Um, and so it's taking in that sulfur and sulfur isolate signatures. But there's a question about what of all the other trace elements. So we've seen there's quite a lot of trace elements associated with these early pyrites. So what's actually happening to them? Um, and there's uh, a colleague, Ling Li Zhao, who's working at ICRAG, who has done quite a lot of mineral chemistry work on um, sphalerites from the sheen and the seen things like increases in thallium. So maybe all these elements like thallium are also being incorporated into later sulfides as well, and that these early pyrites are way more important than previously taught in terms of sourcing elements and sulfur isotope signatures for these later phases. Um, but a bit of work is needed to link those up. So wrap up. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to kind of go through this. I think I've kind of already summed it up on the, the last slide, but it's pyrite mineral chemistry. It's great. Uh, can help with a lot of different things like orogenesis, fluid moving, and just transport of metals as well. Then often only have pyrite. So it's like looking at it and seeing what we can do with pyrite and how we can make exploration a bit more effective in similar terrains is useful. Um, and yes, I think we've kind of covered all this, but 
I didn't really discuss it today, but pyrite trisalmon chemistry has been used in a lot of other deposits from BMS, Edix, and uh, Porphyry Copper. And so there's a lot of ongoing work that shows really strong potential um, for pyrite as a vector toward mineralization. And so there's a lot of information that we can use to compare and contrast with the IR system as well. And I just wanted to flag some ongoing work by um, colleagues at ICRAG as well. Um, so there is a new post. Out, oh, and actually, before I get to that, um, just to kind of highlight the data I showed here is really only part of the full story because um, this was collected quite uh, late into my PhD. But we have quite a lot of uh, LA ICPMS element maps and spots as well collected at Trinity College Dublin and so that was not discussed today but that data needs to be merged in but unfortunately due to all of the restrictions of COVID that got super delayed um, and just kind of made it into appendix but maybe the next pirate talk I give will include that so stay tuned um, and just to mention we have a new postdoc uh, working at ICRAG at UCD who's started looking at uh, geochemical uh, vectors in the Irish ore field and so one of the parts that Claire is looking at is pyrite and so she's going to be advancing on from this study and taking it out machine and incorporating work of other people um, to show free and pass people as well. So just a little bit of shameless self-promotion uh, so here are a couple of publications so this is the one I refer to throughout about the island pod ore body and um, that goes into a lot more detail about the kind of pyrogenetic setup if you want a bit more context there um, and also this is completely unrelated to what I talked to today but the title could have also been used to cover um, the kind of carbonate fluid evolution and so if you're interested to learn a bit more about clumped isotopes um, there's this recent paper but also uh, if you attended the SGA recently, there is a recording available or just email me for it. I'm happy to share it. And I think I just want to say thank you <laughs> to everyone who has helped. Um, there's been a huge range of collaborators involved with the, pirate, or the, the project you've seen today. Um, but I just wanted to flag that there's a huge host of other people who've helped out during my PhD. And I just wanted to thank everyone, including the wider ICRAG raw materials team, both past and present. Um, and I think, oh yes, uh, uh, this is actually me done, but I uh, just wanted to mention that while I did do my PhD in Ireland, I've now moved over to the Zambian Copper Belt and I'm looking at um, some amazing samples from the, the Zambian Copper Belt in Lubambe. So if anyone's interested in that side of it as well, happy to chat. Um, here's a nice image of a pyrite from some of those drill cores. And here's the information that I'm going to turn back on my camera. Thank you very much. It was fantastic. So we are expanding our pyrite community. <laughs> we have a first question from Magma Gold Corporation. No, I, was just, I was just curious if the, uh, any of the uh, trace elements such as cobalt or nickel got uh, abundant enough ever to be recoverable as a byproduct. Uh, if there's enough of them, sorry, do you say? No, the, uh, on the uh, trace elements, I, I didn't know if on such, for example, cobalt would ever get abundant enough to uh, be recoverable. Um, yeah, it's actually, I think, more interesting to look at the nickel at Lachine. And this isn't really something that's been looked at in much detail. And I don't really think nickel or cobalt are something that people who've worked on Lachine think of. Um, but it's actually quite interesting in relation to that steel ore region in particular. Um, so one thing I didn't really mention today is that in terms of our pyrite classification, there's a, um, uh, um, some pyrite phases like pyrite tree that don't actually occur in the steel ore, but in the same pyrogenetic stage and the same morphological kind of setup, we get these nickel and cobalt bearing sulfur salts. Um, and in particular in the steel ore region, there is uh, just a huge amount of nickel associated with it that people just haven't really looked at in much detail. Um, so there's, a, I think, a lot more work that needs to be done on the, the nickel distribution machine and to see if there's actually any potential there. But um, that's a little bit outside my realm of expertise, I think. Hi, Eileen. It's David Stewart here. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, I was always kind of um, intrigued by what these sort of trace elements like cobalt, nickel, arsenic, copper say about the thermodynamics mm. in, in light of the classic Irish style uh, mineralization models. I wondered if you had a view on that. Okay. Yeah, actually, in terms of thermodynamic studies, it's not something I've uh, been into a lot of detail about, but it's actually, I think, brings me to another part of nickel, because the nickel 
has really started to interest me. So I, I really want to go explore that new data I have to see if anything comes out of it because it's a, a bit more spatially representative. But um, so, for example, in the, the island pod, um, uh, if you look at the nickel distribution and I kind of mentioned really briefly that it actually has some of the highest concentrations of nickel associated with some of the pyrophases. Um, I actually don't think that's purely hydrothermal. I think there's quite a significant uh, influence from, say, marine component, maybe, or just somewhere other than the hydro component. And that's based on looking at the nickel cobalt ratios um, in terms of uh, sources of the fluids and also um, just the association of it as well, because it's uh, quite a lot of it's associated with diagenetic pyro, I believe, um, from memory. But yeah, it's just really interesting, I think, because um, I think in terms of the island pod, it's one of the highest, or I think it is the highest uh, ore body in Lachine, but it actually seems to have less significant influence from those higher temperature hydrothermal fluids. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any major known feeder fault. So it's a bit against what you think because it's a bit away from the feeder fault zones. And there's a lot of different reasons I think that could be that, but um, I think, yeah, so I, I, don't, I think that might have, diverted a bit from your original question but um i think it's definitely uh, the term dynamic modeling is a really interesting part to follow up on and i'm um, definitely happy to try pursue it a bit more mm. my my understanding was that the um there was quite a lot of nickel in the main east area and where where storfite was originally found and i was yeah. wondering whether the the location of some of these these higher yeah, yeah. places like 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 in the island pod maybe maybe indicate that they're structural feeders are maybe not in not all located in the south and the classic yeah. classically defined main and derivative faults actually sorry i just had something to add to that based on what you just said the those kind of weird sulfur salts like just uh pronunciation issues uh, uh nickel align and all those were actually really rare in dialing pod um so it definitely seems like it's away from the kind of hydrothermal influence you'd expect so it almost seems like the kind of classic uh textures that you associate with feeders kind of stick through because uh, right by the feeder zones in say the Derryville or main zone, um, the main east is where those really complex textures and you got really more abundant um, of the sulfur salts and uh, like um, those ones you mentioned as well. And um, so it does definitely seem to be related. You could probably map it all out and see it line up perfectly with feeder faults. So in theory, it could be used to identify unknown feeders as well. Um, and there was some minor components found in the island pod, I believe, um, but it was work is about four years ago, so I'd have to go and test my uh, knowledge. But um, yeah, I just think it was quite minor relative to where feeder faults were known. Okay, thanks. I, just just to mention that the the nickel ore body or the nickel mineralization was looked at by the the miners at the time. Um, Murray oh, yeah. Smith, Murray Smith was looking at it. Um, but okay. uh, my understanding was that. It was too late in the mining sequence, and there wasn't quite enough of a of a tonnage okay. to make it worthwhile. Oh, it's really interesting, actually, because thanks thanks for flagging that as well, actually, because the report I've read was um, from Passamore um, as well, who worked on Lachine. So it's a really good point that the initial steel ore work was done, but I didn't realize uh, that conclusion does. Thank you. No problem. Cheers. Um, thanks, Elaine, and thanks for a great talk and great photos. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we have a question from YouTube, I think just building on to the Nicole um, discussion that you just had now. So Marta would like to know, oh, well, she says, great, okay, Lynn, thank you. Uh, she she wonder if your samples also have a sinopyrite associated with, and if so, uh, how would, for example, Nicole and Cobalt fractionate between pyrite and asinopyrite? And then the follow-up question is also, how does, it, how does that affect the use of pyrite as a monitor of fluids? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so there, are, there is definitely arsenic pyrite associated, but it was actually more in line with just arsenic rich pyrite, which uh, is a very fine line, I feel. Um, we're about 40% weight or something. Um, but yeah, so I actually didn't focus too much on the arsenic, uh, arsenic pyrite, but um, a colleague, Oakley Turner, would have spent a lot more time looking at that in his deposits as well. Um, but when I looked, this is pulling on my memory, um, from what I remember, it was not at the same pyrogenetic stage as um, any of the other pyrites, that it was generally at slightly different times. Um, and so the, the one that really uh, pops to mind in terms of 
kind of mineral assemblages is that marcasite is often taught to form at the same time as a lot of pyrites but um based on some reflected light petrography at very high zoom it actually was very slightly brecciating earlier pyrite phases so that it was actually much later than it, um, it looked in initial studies and from what i remember it was a very similar story with arsenal pyrite when it was available and um from the oh actually a very nice image pops mind uh, that would give the pyrogenic stage uh, to that uh, one phase of arsenal pyrite that did occur was actually quite late and was associated with the chalco pyrite um, and not earlier pyrite so it was found as these really small cubes within chalco pyrite veins for example really nice euhedral vein so i don't personally uh, think there's too much overlap but um when it comes to the other minerals in terms of like sulfo salts that do seem to occur at the same pyrogenetic stage um i think I might need a reminder of the second part of the question if this isn't answering it, but um, it's actually quite interesting because if you forget to look at the other, um, like sulfur salts that are really elevated in nickel and cobalt and things, it makes it look like that stage just has a little bit less than you'd expect in terms of like pyrite and things like that. Um, but those other sulfur salts could be just taking up all of those nickel and cobalt and making it seem like pyrites in that area have less of those elements but just because they're being preferentially put into the sulfur salts things like that um i think that answers your question or um if you how lilia did i forget the second part um the second part was how that affects the use of pyrite as a monitor for fluids <laughs> yes it did um, yeah yeah that's a really uh, good question as well um i think really the main thing is that you just need to look at your full sulfide assemblage so in terms like obviously this talk was going into a crazy lot of detail about pyrite but that was after a lot of work on the overall pyrogenic setting and trying to figure out where everything set together because um oh, something to flag was uh those i spent about two years of my phd looking at pyrites before i realized that they were zoned like they were which looking at some of those images you'd wonder how but initially the pyrite story didn't seem that interesting kind of seemed a bit boring uh like it wasn't much going on and then I went over to do some microprobe work at uh, Memorial University, mostly looking at like um, the other sulfides, including some of these pyrites I had characterized. Um, and the SEM conditions were just uh, different in terms of the contrast and light density. And all of a sudden, these pyrites were beautifully zoned. Um, that was just missing with the, the contrast settings. So that's, if you're looking at pyrites, I suggest playing around with your SEM contrast. Um, Oh, Jesus, yeah. But in terms of like the overall story, I just think it's really important to take that step back first and don't just zoom in. You need to understand where your pyrite sit in relation to everything else. And if there's something else that could be co-precipitating, that could be taking the element associations you expect and things. Hayley, I'm, I'm just really interested, obviously, in like the morphologies and the perigenesis of all the different pyrites. And um, so the pyrites zero the diagenetic pyrite is that the only pyrite that had, was the inclusions unique to that pyrite or did you sit in other parts of the perigenesis um and, so and also yeah now just to like add on to that you said that the like the the oolites the oolite member <laughs> that pyrite is similar right to the pyrite zero was the inclusions in that pyrite how did you tell how can you tell that that's um, just based on how it looks under the microscope that yeah, that's a good question. And um, I struggled with that myself at the start. Um, so the main thing between those two phases is that um, they are hosted in different stratigraphic levels. Um, so the the kind of diagenetic inclusion rich one, the pyrite zero in my head, um, is the one that generally has the lowest sulfur isotope signatures. They're the ones that are generally minus 30 and below. Uh, no real clear hydrothermal influence um, on those. And you I've never come across any textural zoning, for example. They're not always that inclusion rich. Um, and I know you can get that kind of inclusion rich textures from some different processes as well. So the kind of conclusion of diagenetic pyrites come from a combination of techniques, really. Um, is, uh, yeah, I think it can be related to really rapid fluid mixing in some environments as well. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah uh, off track. Um, in terms of how to tell them apart from the, the stuff you like ones, um, uh, I didn't really mention this, I think, in detail, but those pyrite ones uh, that often preserve oolitic uh, or, um, features. So there's a couple of really nice examples where you can see the kind of old um, oolitic fragment really nicely. And 
when it does look very inclusion rich when you look at it but when you actually zoom in a little bit more there's lots of these really nice hydrothermal zones um in them which now that you've reminded me i should really share with you there and um uh, you can also see little bits of high, uh, green and things and also the, high, uh, the sulfur isotope signatures are uh, slightly higher as well so while they're still about minus i think 25 to minus 10 we're starting to see more of a hydrothermal influence so they are kind of the first manifestation i guess of um pyrite hydrothermal influence it's just really less compared to later um phases as well um if that makes sense i think well, yeah, yeah. i think very much thank you so much Eileen. <laughs> also uh, apologies for shout out but um, yeah if you if you have anything you'd like to ask more detail happy to chat more and to send on those images because there's I went a bit mad with the imaging and so could definitely have many images for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I have a question for you as well. So these systems are for the vision in time, right? It's a lower carboniferous overall, so it's a, yeah. Okay, so I'm just wondering, can you comment on metamorphism <laughs> on distribution of the uh, elements within pyrite? Um, personally, not so much, but I think that's really interesting. Um, it's the, the metamorphic influence, remember, isn't crazy bad. At, um, um, but that's not something I actually looked into myself, but it's something that I do want to look at for BMS deposits in relation to pyrex. So um, I don't think Ireland is the best place to test a metamorphic influence on trace element distribution, but I suspect pyrite will record its original composition and that to kind of decipher the influence of metamorphism and metamorphic fluids on pyrite and try some distribution, you could potentially look at things like if the element is um, like a crystal bound and the, the crystallitis, or if it's like a nano inclusion, for example, um, and things like that. So there are a few ways to go about testing it. Um, it just, I haven't done it personally. Oh, okay. I think we've got one more question. So when it comes to sulfur isotope compositions of sulfide minerals, it has been demonstrated some difficulties about the interpretation of uh, sulfur. Mm. Uh, so specifically when we have to distinguish the uh, magmatic uh, and the morphic origin when it comes to all fluid, uh, all fluid. So, do you mind if you can comment uh, how does it work in that case? Yeah, so <laughs> something that I did when I, uh, I, I don't know, maybe I just bright light. I um, undertook quite a lot of sulfur isotope signatures of the island pod because the island pod was really where I spent quite a lot of time just looking at because I can't remember if I said this, uh, but the island pod was a really unique place to look at the replacement textures and um, figure out kind of the overall history because the island pod had less significant or less extensive replacement compared to elsewhere. So those kind of textures that might be completely obliterated elsewhere and make interpretation of the kind of like textural history or what's going on very difficult are much better preserved in the island pods. So we see things like partial replacement. And um, so it's, it's that's why quite a lot of work focused on there and then was subsequently expanded out. But in terms of the sulfur isotopes, um, much most of the the previous work had been done on the kind of main zones we just kind of wanted to see if the island pod fit in with the classic idea of uh, the sulfur isotope sources and the fluid mixing model for the rest of the machine which the main conclusion was it was but that there was a more or less significant hydrothermal influence um, and in terms of how where that kind of model came from i guess um there was quite a lot of work done i'm going to say the 90s and 2000s and uh, hope I'm right, by several different people, but quite a lot in particular by Adrian Boyce over his work um, on figuring out the sulfur isotope signatures um, at Lachine and uh, not just Lachine, the, the Irish ore field and trying to figure out what was going on. Um, and they came to the conclusion that we have two sulfur sources, one coming from uh, bacteriogenically um, sulfate reduction. And this is coming from sulfate reduced from um, seawater uh, sulfate at the time by uh, the bacteria. Um, and that is, I think, pretty well understood in terms of you get these huge fractionations in an open system. Um, and so you, that's responsible for these minus 40s. And like, I think the lowest value I got in the pod was minus 55, which was very low. I think it was the lowest out of much of Lachine, potentially the Irish Orfield. Um, 
and so that that kind of side of it is pretty well understood um and then there's the other idea of the hydrothermal sulfur and that's a very vague term i realize but the overall idea um is that the hydrothermal fluids went through the lower paleozoic basement and leached some of the the sulfides and sulfur from sulfides so for example pyrites from the those the basement um, and so that's based on a, a bit of work i think it was by everett um I'm not going to remember the year that looked at lower paleozoic basement veins that hosted sulfides and were able to sulfurize the signatures on it um, and they were able to show that the um comparison of uh, or, uh, sorry so um, one thing about sulfur isotopes that um, the sulfur isotope signature doesn't um, kind of fractionate and change much if you're leaching it from in hydrothermal fluids so that the signatures of hydrothermal fluids that we see like up to plus 10 uh, per mil or something like that um, are representative of source so in this case the lower paleozoic basement and Everett was able to show a really nice matchup between those so that's the kind of basis for where that idea has come from and there's been many people who've looked into the potential of say thermo um, sulfur uh, refractionation and different ways you can get the sulfur isotope distribution that we see in the Irish ore field um so yeah that's why i didn't really go into detail on that today because it's yeah it could probably be an a talk completely uh, by itself um but one thing the study of the island pod did show was the impact of re uh, replacement and recycling of sulfur isotopes within the system so i talked there about the the hydrothermal fluid sourcing the sulfur from lower paleozoic basement veins um, and then we so we got lots of early pyrite forming but this early pyrite went, underwent really significant replacement by later fluids that resulted in salarite, galena and whatever. Um, and one important thing is during this replacement that sulfur was liberated and freed, but it was then taken into these later phases. And so we see overlaps of sulfur isotope signatures. Um, and that's based uh, on work by the island pod, but compared to deposits elsewhere that have kind of identified those trends as well. So that's still like needs a little bit more work i think and um if anyone really wants to do silver isotope work on the machine i can touch but um there's a huge amount of data there to pull from and in terms of the sources of hydrothermal fluids which i saw in your question um that kind of links in a little bit more to the carbonate studies that i did and um, so we looked at these early carbonate phases and um, they're really closely associated with early pre or stages and tried to figure out where the sources of fluids are coming from and so it just links into like the clumped oxygen carbon isotopes which looks at the temperature of the fluids as well and the, the um, chemical composition but also things like strontium isotopes and merging of all these data sets to figure out what's happening to the fluids and um, why we ended up where we are so that is actually a complete other talk in itself so i'll stop talking now before i start going on and on um but if you want any questions uh, or have any questions please email about that because I can, I can share the talk that talks a little bit more about the uh Lynn, thanks Lynn, for that uh discussion that we just had uh, <laughs> so we have two last questions on youtube uh so the it's from haruna uh, i said thank you aileen for the great talk um Haruna is wondering if uh, there are earlier diagenetic pyrite than the pyrite zero that you mentioned, for example, the paraframboids next to your zoned pyrite mm. two. And the follow-up question to that or the add-on question is that if that's the case, how do the mineral chemistry compare to that of the pyrite zero? So what was the first part of that, Haruna? The first part is um, Haruna is wondering if there are earlier diagenetic pyrite uh, than the pyrite zero. Oh, um, that's a um, that's a great question. So there is actually from boiled pyrites, and um, I saw a single from boiled, and it's it's actually quite cool what happens with the from boiled pyrites because they undergo a really specific type of salarite replacement called a toll type replacement, where it replaces the cores, um, and it can make it really deceptive if you're looking at them. Um, but in terms of the mineral chemistry, I unfortunately do not have any information about the mineral chemistry of um, from boiled pyrites versus the kind of why I showed as pyrite zero um, here today. Um, but that would be very cool to compare to. I, there is probably data for that somewhere in the Irish ore field because there is quite a bit of from boiled pyrite related to that early bacteriogenic. Um, oh God, it always catches me. The early bacteriogenically reduced sulfate um, as well. 
Thanks, Aileen. And the last question from YouTube, uh, our YouTube has been active today, which is a good mm-hmm. thing. The last question says, is the hydrogen and oxygen isotopes better than the sulfur isotopes in chemistry, in hydrothermal fluids, uh, uh, evolution or transport fingerprints for pyrite? Um, yeah, that's actually a good question. I guess um, I might have misled a little bit with that. So I think the best combination to understand the full kind of story is is both because the, the carbonite study was really looking um, at the like early dolmatizing. So the, the Walsh-Ocean limestone formation underwent regional dolmatization in um, Lachine and the Rat Downey trend in general. It's, it's a really common feature of the area. Um, so we were trying to look at what, the, what is going on with uh, the hydrothermal fluids or what had the dramatization processes is and what led to it. Um, and so we're trying to, I guess, expand the hydrothermal un- like history understanding, like when did the hydrothermal activity start? What did it lead to? Where does the pyrite fit into that? So the pyrite chemistry study was specifically to look at the pyrite, but the carbonate study um, didn't really like focus too much on it. Um, but it, <laughs> you probably up hydrogen isotopes, which uh, I find funny because uh, one of the main conclusions from the hydrogen isotope study is we either need to do more or not use it because it was a bit, um, there hadn't, hasn't been much hydrogen isotope work, especially in the Irish overfield on dolomite phases. So um, I think there's quite a bit of work needed to fully understand and confirm that data is um, usable. Um, but it's, it's, it's really interesting, I think. And like when you com- combine it all, you get a much neater picture but there just needs to be a bit more knitting together of that, I think. But um, hopefully that answers you. Thanks for that talk. Uh, and everyone is saying thank you in the chat. So um, thank thanks for, for the interesting talk, interesting pictures. And uh, thanks everyone for attending our um, afternoon session. And I think with that, we can close the room. So keep safe and we'll see you in two weeks time. Good. From what Deposits thanks. Hub team and myself, it is good night or good morning, depending on where you're finding yeah. yourself from. Goodbye. Thanks for coming, everyone. And thanks for the positive.